Hello again, art history students. Welcome to the next little video lecture. Today we are going to talk about the Northern Renaissance. So the last thing that we covered was medieval and Gothic art in Europe. And we this is Chartres Cathedral. You should remember it from the um, previous lecture. And I left you guys with this question. How could artists represent in two dimensions the soaring spirituality of the gothic style of architecture how would they ever be able to compare to that level of engulfment right both from the way in which architecture kind of surrounds you and you can't visually take it all in at once and then also sort of the spiritual um, the soaring spirituality of those large stained glass windows and the super high ceilings and whatnot and the effect that that has on you physically. <clears throat> so if you watch the little video that I linked up above this video in Blackboard, um, we you should already kind of have a little bit of an idea. Um, we're focusing this lecture in northern the area kind of between France and Germany, which is Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, the colored map is like a contemporary map of borders and outlines and stuff, just to give you guys an idea of where we are in the world. And, excuse me, I'm gonna make a few comparisons in this lecture between uh, the Italian Renaissance, which we haven't actually talked about yet. That's what we're gonna talk about next. Um, and then the Northern Renaissance. So just so you guys know, these things are happening simultaneously in two different geographic areas. So some things that I'm gonna say are not gonna make 100% sense until the next lecture and just, just flow with me on that. So things like the Northern Renaissance is less concerned about perspective, more concerned with symbolism and those kind of things. Um, is just a way to, I just want you to compare and contrast them. And I talk about the Northern Renaissance first because you're probably familiar with the Italian Renaissance a little bit from history. It's Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, that Renaissance. So you, because you may be a little bit familiar with that, I talk about this one first. So on that note, reading a few of your um, responses to some of the things that um, I've seen from your discussion posts and stuff like that, I think there might be a little bit of confusion about iconography and symbolism. So an establishment of iconography is that an entire group understands what something means, right? So Mary is here in blue, Right, we see her here. That's how we know that that is Mary, the mother of Christ, right, of Jesus. Her hair color doesn't matter. All those other kinds of things are not important. It's that sh she is dressed in blue. Whenever Mary is not in blue, it's kind of a big deal. So something symbolic would be something like, in the background, there are dark, gloomy, windows or dark gloomy mountains or something and it's symbolic of the you know pain that some individual is going through <clears throat> something of that nature so just for clarity's sake that is the difference between symbolism and iconography iconography is a culturally established notification of who someone is and then symbolism is just kind of using it's a metaphor. So anything can be symbolic. This pen can be symbolic, right? The pen is mightier than the sword, right? Something like that. That is um, using symbolism for a metaphor. So that's kind of the difference uh, between the two. Iconography is culturally understood. All right, so if you watch that awesome video, you should be familiar with Jan van Eyck. I'm not gonna go, I'm just gonna touch on a few things real quickly in some of the artworks that you should already be familiar with from watching that video. So this is Madonna and the Chancellor Roland. If you remember from the video 
there was this idea that at this time in history, when you were to see a sacred figure, right? In this case, Mary and child. Mary does have red on. She does have this little bit of blue under here, right? So it is very odd that she's not completely in blue, but um, she does have a little bit of blue on there. So Chancellor Rohan, Roll, Chancellor Roland, sorry, is um, at this moment kind of fulfilling this religious fantasy to see a religious character or a sacred character in real life right and there's that belief that something from what you see kind of goes into your eye and i think this can help us kind of understand some of the iconoclasms that are happening at this time and happened previously in history right? another thing i just want to point out is these windows in the background right in the previous lecture when we talked about gothic architecture we talked about how windows were not something that everyday people had remember chancellor roland is probably the richest person in the area in the 1400s right you learned should have learned about that so all those circles are from the glass being hand blown so windows and whatnot are starting to become a technology that people are seeing more often all right that artwork by Jan van Eyck was very, very famous. Almost immediately after its creation, other artists were copying it. So Jan van Eyck is the, he is not the first artist that we have named in this class, but he is the one of the first big artists. And like I said, this unit on the Renaissance has a lot to do with names. So names are something that you definitely have to pay attention to, and Jan van Eyck is certainly one of them. So this is the Ghent altarpiece in its closed state. And this really goes back to answering that question that I asked before, how could a two-dimensional artwork ever kind of compare with an architectural building and how the light would come in? So Jan van Eyck is using that light, right? There's a, this big giant window up here and it shines light in and all of these people in the closed form and in the open form here is the open form are responding to that light even the uh angels with their little crowns have reflections of the actual window so that's one of the way artists are um artists are kind of answering that question or kind of coming to terms with that the comparison between two-dimensional art and then this three-dimensional architectural space. All right, this is the Afrinati portrait. I definitely, there will absolutely 100% be questions about this on the test. So definitely, if you didn't watch that video, go back and watch it. It's very interesting. If this is your first time seeing it because you decided to skip that other video, um, if you look at this artwork and you're thinking to yourself, what's going on in this very enigmatic artwork you should definitely watch that video i will also say on a personal note that this statement back here if you remember from the video says jan van eyck was here and it was originally thought that that was a testament to the marriage between these two people but then we kind of see there's another theory behind that but this the power in that statement that jan van eyck was here um I love and I also love if I ever see graffiti on train cars or anything like that that says Jake was here or something like that. I always I always have this um, ornery smile that thinks Jake doesn't even know how powerful a statement is that he was there. So that's Jan van Eyck was here is what's written in the back there. All right. Here is some of the information which also kind of conflicts with the theory that we're going with in this class so the first theory was that this is just a straightforward marriage proposal that was the theory that was um, popular when i was in school and the first theory that i was taught and there are many other theories but i think it's really important that you guys know there are multiple theories and i think the theory from the video holds quite a bit of weight so make sure you tune into that this is an artwork by Jan van Eyck that was not in the 
uh, BBC documentary that you would have just watched. So here we see Madonna in a church. So this church is, this image is made to look kind of like a window or like a mirror. Just so you know, this is not an exact replica of a real church. It's not like this artwork was created to hang inside of said cathedral and mirror the architecture behind it. This is kind of an imagined space. But one thing that's important is people, like regular people, are like yay tall, right? If they were to stand next to the Madonna. Um, very short by comparison to her. So it is this exaggerated figure in this space that we're familiar with. And then we can understand scale by that imagined figure in that imagined space, right? And the magnitude of that character or that, that sacred spiritual individual, right? All right, so a lot of things are happening and that are different in the north and not so much in the italian renaissance which is contemporary to this one so one is secularism which is non-religious themed art when we get to the italian renaissance next lecture it is very heavy on religious themed art there's a lot of the same uh stories right the same uh figures and characters are repeated over and over again by different artists and they all have to do uh, with Christianity, <clears throat> with a few exceptions. And then there's the printmaking process, which we're going to talk about, and the Protestant Reformation. So let's go through all these things kind of chronologically. So this is an idea about secular art. So secularism or secular art is non-religious themed. So what we see here is we see people depicting the seasons with what's going on in the sky right so this is actually a series of artworks let me go to the next slide so you can see all of them all right this is kind of a large series of artworks that are almost referential right remember that people can't really read so it doesn't do a lot of good to say in the winter you will see x y and z stars in the sky right something like this an image or a series of images like this that show the passage of time show the agricultural cycle right and also charting the stars at the same time this is nothing new but this is very informative art this is kind of like really early um like a really early graph because so maybe a good way to put it all right the next secular artwork that we're going to look at is Peter Berger, The Elders, Netherland, Netherlandish Proverbs. Yeah. So if you've never heard of a proverb, you've probably heard one, just not heard it called a proverb. So proverbs are things that people say. They're little language statements, um, right? Pen is mightier than the sword. That could be a proverb. And this image depicts those colloquial sayings in a humorous way. So let's look at some of them, which you might be familiar with. So this is the detail of the man hitting his head against a brick wall. If, you, if you're doing something over and over again and you expect to get the same results, someone might say to you like, don't hit your head against a brick wall. Like don't keep tackling this or approaching this in the same way. Right? So that's a, a proverb or a statement that came about at this time in history and it's being depicted. One that you're probably more familiar with is don't cry over spilt milk. Um, everyone's probably heard that and here we see a depiction of that. This one is by far one of my favorites and I hope that everyone starts to integrate it into their vocabulary. So if you look here, you can see these two guys um, inside of this window who are holding on to each other's noses. And the proverb is fools lead each other by the nose. So the idea behind this, and I think um, in my experience, I went to school with these two um, boys and you probably know people like this who are attached at the hip and then they're always in trouble 
but not like in a terrible way. It's just they do foolish things and they egg each other on, right? To to do whatever the foolishness is. And it's the it's idea that both these people are holding each other's noses and neither of them can get anywhere. Nobody can see where they're going, right? So that's kind of the the joke behind leading each other by the nose. And I think it's definitely a um I don't want to be I don't want to be judgmental, but I think it's definitely a trait that young boys have. Um very common when they're close friends they get each other in trouble all right moving on so this is the netherlandish proverbs it's very interesting you can google it if you want to look and see some more of these interesting kind of proverbs and statements and other kind of funny things in the background all right Next that we're gonna look at, this is a religious artwork. So we've kind of moved away from secularism. So this is Hermannius Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights. So Hermannius Bosch really stands out as an artist in that when he came about, there was no artwork like his. And then for a very, very long time, no one made art in the same way that he does until the 20th century. So this is one of those this is called a triptych and it opens very similar to how the Ghent altarpiece opens. So if you watch that video, you kind of saw that happening and you can see how this object would open the same. So what we have here is we have the Garden of Eden over here and we have Adam, right? So we put a little dot there next to him. And then here in this larger panel, we have the Garden of Earthly Delights, right? Which is symbolic statement of earth and all the sins of the flesh that happen here on earth and we'll get into some of those in just a moment and then in the third panel you have sort of hell or the consequence of all of those earthly delights and you see this character here right looks like adam and if we were to draw a line between their eyes they're basically making contact from this original person who had the original sin of the flesh was eating the apple and all those sorts of things all the way to the consequence on the other side so they're kind of making um eye contact via that thread of thought also at this time it's believed that hell whatever your sins are in this realm there's a specific thing that happens to you in the afterlife right or in this um negative negative sacred realm setting right and one of them is if you have sins of the flesh which was what adam had that your body is then hollowed out so we see him depicted there kind of with this hollow body so let's look at some of the details a little bit so here we see lots of imagery of fruits and berries right along with some of these kind of um the fruit is oftentimes used as a symbolic term for your um your fruits your you know your body your reproductive organs and whatnot so that's where that symbolism is coming from and again this is depicting the garden of earthly delights my favorite little area is this character here which is this cat creature with a unicorn and then there is a man jousting with a fish on it right about to to kill another man with a fish and i think this is also violence can be one of the um sins of the flesh or like a like a bloodlust kind of thing so but it's created in this very fantasyful kind of way and then i also put this interesting bird man in here because he has this reflection right this artwork was not created for a specific chapel or a specific church in the same way that the ghent altarpiece was but there may be a little bit of that same technique going on of tying sort of the real world light into the um imagery that you see so that's Hermione's Bosch next we're going to talk about just briefly the Protestant Reformation so as you look at this image you can probably tell just right off the bat that it's loaded with symbolism just because of the way there are all kinds of 
things and objects that are surrounding um, the ambassadors, right? And this is by Hans Holmer the Younger. You're probably going to see this on the test. And this is about the Protestant Reformation. So I'm going to give you, this is a very complicated issue, but I'm going to give you the super, super short version of the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism, right? Which is Catholic, which is what is in Italy, right? And this is relevant to the art that we see. Remember when we saw um, Jan van Eyck, just a couple slides ago, Jan van Eyck's image of the Chancellor Roland and the Madonna and Child, right? And they were right next to each other. They could see each other visually. Roland could see the Madonna with his eyes. And in the Protestant belief structure, you can connect or talk or be in communication with the sacred realm characters in immediacy, right? You have a direct mental communication with that, right? Via prayer. In Catholicism, you do not. There is like this strict hierarchy and that will be explained a little bit more in the next lecture when we get to the early Italian Renaissance. So what I'm explaining now is the fact that there is a break in the religion. There is a break in what people believe and how they believe that the structure of how you communicate with the sacred realm. And this break in belief was not a peaceful one. It was not like the Catholics and the Protestants said to each other, hey, I believe something slightly different than what you believe. Hey, that's cool. Peace be with you and went their separate ways. That was not the case. This was a very violent and bloody separation. It was wrapped up in politics and all these other kinds of things. So that's what this artwork is actually about. So let's look at some of the details a little bit more. So here we have, these are two details, right? We have a crucifix up here, which is almost covered by this curtain, which takes over the whole background. And that curtain covers the whole background of the image, all right? But it's almost just peeking through. And that's the idea that at the core of this argument is a belief and is a religion, right? But it's almost being covered by all these other issues, which are more political and social and economic issues that are coming into problem, right? So this is supposed to be the core of everything, but it's almost hidden, right? So it's the symbolic use of the curtain. Curtains provide privacy, you close them, right? That's kind of the idea, it's covering something up, right? So that's what's going on with that curtain symbolically. And then also this is a lute here, this kind of, um, detail of this musical instrument. I had to make it very large just so you could see that super fine broken string. And that symbolizes the loss of harmony. Anytime something is broken in a musical instrument, it can't play, right? Just like there can't be this, you know, this is a religious symbolism about the loss of the harmony. So you guys get that? So there's one other kind of strange thing in the image. That is, I'm sure you noticed it, this weirdness going on here at these two guys feet and this is called an anamorphosis it's a type of optical illusion where you can only see this skull where it looks like this here if you're standing here in front of the painting right so this is you look at me drawing a little stick figure right you can then see that skull if you stand right in front of it it looks like this weird elongated oval all right. So this, again, is also symbolic for this conflict and this break that's happening at this time, right, that the problem, you can't see everything from one perspective. You have to turn your head to, to see everything clearly, to get all of the information, right? So, again, using symbolism, very heavy on the symbolism. All right, so there's the image, large again. You can see that interesting anamorphosis. That's a vocabulary word that will probably be on the test. All right, so now we're talking about printmaking. So one thing that printmaking does is it makes images, it makes more images so that they're easy to distribute. So let's, next slide. All right, so this is not a 
um, Northern Renaissance artwork or anything like that. This is just a, just so you guys understand the printmaking process. This is a copper plate, right? That has been, there have been lines carved into it. And then ink is smeared into those and then paper is put on top and then there's like a press involved and you can peel that paper off and you can get multiples of this same image, right? Thus you can distribute them widely and thus you can, your artwork is put out there, a wider audience can see it. If you wanna see the Ghent altarpiece at this time in history, you must travel to Ghent. You, you have to physically go there and see it, otherwise you'd never be able to see it. So this artwork travels farther, it's accessible to many more people all at once. It's significantly cheaper to kind of produce as far as because you're you as the artist would be putting your time and effort into the um, into the print, into the copper plate, and then you can make multiples. And this has a pretty big impact on the world. All right. So now we're moving kind of to Germany. And this is where Johannes Gutenberg comes into play. Um, you may or may not know this name from another um, history course. So Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press, right? Kind of based off of the printmaking process. So how this works is there are different little keys. If you ever used like an old school typewriter, there would be these little um, keys that would come up and hit the page. Maybe you've used that, maybe you haven't, but this was a replaceable. You could take out the letters and put new letters into the printing press. And this began, the world began to become literate at this time because text was much more available, right, to people. Before this, when we talked about in the Gothic era and the medieval era, all text was handwritten by monks and nuns, and they were really the only people who could read it. So this is a massive change for the majority of the world's population or Europe's population at this time. It has huge ramifications. So even though the printing press is not necessarily a piece of art, it has significant impact on the world from a cultural viewpoint and it does create a new art form this is albert durr right this is albert durr working on text and letters and he's actually using the golden ratio to try to come up with letters that are both visually appealing right using that golden ratio from back in when we talked about greece ancient Greece, and also that are easy to read. And then these kind of texts would be, this is kind of what they would make, and then every V would look like that in the printing press. This creates something called typography. And you are very familiar with typography. Every time you write a paper and submit it for anything, you can select what text you want, right? What typography you want, what typeface. Um, and this has, um, in the beginning, it was about aesthetics and then how to, what was easiest to read. And now, obviously, typography has bloomed into this whole new thing, especially in the 21st century with the advent of, you know, the Internet and all that kind of stuff. All right. So here we have the, this was the Gutenberg Bible text. That was the first book that was mass printed and then we have times news roman which came along which uses some of these same things from the gutenberg bible text but it's much easier to read and then as we progress we get much much easier to read text and some that are less easy to read nowadays all right so this is more of albert durr i think there might be a test question about maybe what albert durr might be trying to do with his early typography or what previous art um you know that we've been talking about inspired him might be the golden ratio from greece it might be a test question all right moving on this is albert durr this is his self-portrait so again this is the unit of names of artists so an easy way to know if an artwork is Albert Durer on the test is he always puts his name prominently. This A and D are always kind of 
into integrated into the image in some way. So this is him with a fur colored robe. Let's look at some more of his artwork. This is um, watercolor. Albert Durer was a master of a multitude of materials. So um, you have probably used watercolor in your life, right? If you were in elementary school, you probably used those ovals. You got like a white tray with like six ovals in it that had color. Um, so basically this was created with watercolor and the addition of chalk. And this is called gauche, is how this is pronounced, or one of the ways you can pronounce it. So there's that awesome little AD again for this very, very realistic hair. We've all used watercolor, and I doubt any of us have ever created such a realistic hair out of it, a rabbit. This is a woodblock by Albert Durer. This is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. There again is that nice AD there. So just like the um, printing example that I showed you a couple slides before where there was a metal plate this is using wood and everything that is white on this page would have been carved out of the wood so very time-consuming but again you get multiples once you've created the block this is Albert Durer's Last Supper. This is another wood block. We're going to revisit this a little bit later in this unit here is that awesome Albert Durer. And one thing I want to point out is this is the Last Supper, which we will see a couple Last Suppers, but I want you guys to kind of pay attention to the prominence of that wooden table, right? It is like front and center. It's almost a larger character than some of the people that are sitting around it or behind it or whatnot. It, it kind of like a your attention goes to that large table and we'll kind of compare and contrast a little bit later. All right, this is an engraving by Albert Durer. Here's that awesome little panel with his name, which he always puts on there. All right, so this is using like a zinc plate or um, a copper plate. I'm sorry, like the example that I showed you guys earlier. And then again, so there are multiples of these artworks in creation. My favorite part of this artwork is this like lone goat kind of up here, right? There's this very dramatic scene, right? This very historical moment de being depicted here of Adam and Eve, at least from this religion's standpoint. This is kind of a monumentous moment. And there's just like this goat, just like chilling up up in the sky doing his own thing totally unaware of what's going on below whereas all these other animals seem to almost be kind of involved in the image so it's my favorite little part all right this is the last artwork for this um lecture and it's because it kind of transitions to a new time. So this is known as the Armada portrait, right? So this is Elizabeth I, and we see her Armada. So this is the Queen of England, and England is an island nation that became had a very, very powerful navy, and its navy only rose. So here we see the Armada in what looks like daytime, and here we see it at nighttime. And then Elizabeth also has her hand kind of over top of the globe, right? All the way back when we talked about Rome, we talked about this kind of symbolicness of the hand over top of something, right? Is this meaning of power over it, right? There was this proverb or colloquial saying that the sun never sat on the British Isles, right? And that's why out these two windows, we see her armada in day and at night, because that's happening simultaneously. Um, Britain colonized the world starting at this time, um, all over the place, our own history kind of ties in there and whatnot. So this is kind of the the last of, of this unit that I'm talking about, or I'm sorry, the last of this lecture. These are all the key terms that I want you to know. And then don't forget to do your discussion post. And one other thing that I just want to touch on before I let you go is when we talk about the Italian Renaissance next time, just remember that we're kind of like going back in time and then forward. So these 
the Italian, the early Italian Renaissance and the Norman Renaissance and everything are, are happening simultaneously in different geographic areas. So email me if you don't know what any of these key terms are and don't forget to do your discussion. Have a good day.